Whether you're picking and grinning or just picking or just grinning, grab a drink, pull up a seat. It's time for Roots Music Rambler. Turn it up. So just so everybody knows, if I'm a little edgy on the episode today, it's because we just spent 40 minutes uh, on with tech support trying to get my new setup to work properly, and it doesn't work properly. It's We're recording, work. but we got I got it to the point where I can hear Frank. She can hear me. I can't hear myself, which means I can't use my fancy new equipment other than to have the microphone and everything. So I'm a little peeved as we start this recording, but we'll, we'll soldier through. Might some bourbon help? Oh, man. If, I, if I'd had a couple bourbons in me when I was on with this tech support guy, I probably would be being arrested at the moment. But, oh, oh, well, I'm glad that's, yeah. that didn't happen. That's okay. I mean, I, I understand. He, it's not his fault. I don't know what the hell happened. We went through all the troubleshooting, and it still doesn't work, so I'll have to figure it out. But anyway. All right. So on the first episode, the last episode when we were talking, I told you that um, – uh, my girlfriend Karen and I are going to Red Rocks uh, in October to see Ryan Adams. And you're still going to rub it in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to rub it in. I'm going to continue to rub it in. Don't you worry. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we will edit in highlights from the Ryan Adams concert into a future episode when I have the video. I'll probably get, you know, dinged for that, but whatever. Yeah. All right. So I'm telling my daughter, Katie, who is 15, um, I'm telling her this. And she connects the dots that Ryan Adams is Phoebe Bridger's ex. So I did not know that. Yeah. So Phoebe Bridger's and Ryan Adams dated for a while, a while back. And I, I read a little bit of the scuttlebutt on some website somewhere. And I don't necessarily want to repeat something that may or may not be true. Right. But they broke up and Phoebe Bridgers is one of the people who has accused Ryan Adams of um, being abusive. I think emotionally abusive, not physically abusive, but like emotionally abusive in the relationship. So Ryan Adams is kind of in the wake of being semi canceled um, because of all this. It it has been for a few years now. Yeah. Yes. So (laughs) you're never going to believe what my daughter is trying to talk me into doing. I'll give you a guess. Does it involve a sign? Does it involve a sign? Sort of. Does it involve you asking for summer of 69? (laughs) No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) So Katie said, I will buy you a Phoebe Bridgers shirt to wear to the Ryan Adams concert. Now, this is only relevant if you know that I have third row tickets. So there's a pretty good chance if I wore a Phoebe Bridgers shirt to the Ryan Adams show, he would see it. So probably, probably third row. My goodness. God, I hate hey, you. I date well. I, I didn't have anything to do with Clearly. it. I just showed up and she said yes and invited me to a show. So. <laughs> Damn. So maybe I, so I should I, date Karen. So I'm at no. So I'm asking. Uh, I'm asking you if you think I should do that. Should I wear a Phoebe Bridgers shirt to the Ryan Adams show? Hmm. Well, it depends. Are you going to be drinking bourbon? Number one. Oh number yeah. Number two. Um, okay. So being in the third row, he probably would see it, but. Would he really be paying enough attention? Um, And then the other thing is, like, it might piss off other people that are there. Uh, Um, And, you know, we all want to be friends at shows, right? Nobody wants to hang out or be near assholes at shows. Um, (laughs) So, uh, you know, I don't know. That's a tough one. And I find myself in a very difficult spot too because i've loved ryan adams 
his music um, since his Whiskey Town days. You know, mm -hmm. Strangers Almanac was one of my all time favorite is one of my all time favorite albums. And I was listening to that in like 1996 or 97, whatever. Um, and then, you know, I followed his solo stuff and then all this drama began <laughs> and I kind of it's been difficult for me to get back into his music, yeah. although I would probably not turn down the opportunity to see him at Red Rocks. OK, um, here in Chicago, I mean, he's played a couple times and I didn't go and I felt fine, you know, um, but to see him or anyone at Red Rocks at this point, it's one of those places I have to get to before I die. Um, you know, I would not turn down that opportunity. So um, I might forego the Phoebe Bridgers t-shirt, although Katie, <laughs> that is a brilliant idea. Yeah. Um, and I love you for that. Um, I'm sure my 14 year old would probably, you know, she would yeah. love it just as much. Um, so I had no idea though that they dated. So I'm guessing this is post Mandy Moore. Um, I, I don't know the timeline of who Ryan Adams dates. I have no idea. Um, okay. Well, he was I, married to Mandy Moore. Yeah, I, I would say it was post that. And the story that 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 I read and or the combination of the story that I read and that my daughter told me was um, that she was supposed to be on his record label and there was a business decision made and she wasn't going to be on his record label. And that's what caused the breakup that he got hmm. pissed that she wasn't going to whatever. And I mean, he's 20 years older than she is. I was just going to say, there's got to be a huge age difference too, yeah. um, which, so, you know, isn't sometimes it works, you know, um, it's not, not like it's a, a death wish or anything. Um, but wow. Okay. I learned something new. There you go. So yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're, uh, she's the boy genius lead singer, right? Is that, the, uh, well, she's, one, one of, of the, the, the one of the boys, player. as I learned, they're called. Okay. Um, you know, my teen likes to school me on all things boy genius. Yeah. So, um, yeah, she's one of the boys, and okay. um, you know, they do equal parts. Um, okay. You know, lead vocals, songwriting, that sort of thing. I hear songs that my daughter plays. I don't know who's singing or who's in the group. I know that I, I'm aware enough to know that it's a super group. I don't know okay. who the other two people are. I'd never heard of Phoebe Bridgers either until this whole thing started happening. Um, but I've I've now since learned who these people are, and I need to pay attention to them. So I, I'll get I'll school myself All or right. have my daughter school me. But uh, yeah, there that was go. that was an interesting conversation. Now the the trick, if and 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 by the way, for you listeners and or viewers out there, uh, messages, comment, whatever. If you think I should wear the Phoebe Bridger <laughs> shirt to the Ryan Adams concert. I'm not saying I'm going to do it because I think Francesca kind of tipped the the hand there. If I do that, I'm the asshole, right? I'm the guy that everybody there is not going to like. So I yeah. don't want to be that guy. I mean, I I would I would do it if I felt like everybody would be in on the joke and they would think it was funny, but I don't want to piss anybody off. So I'm probably not yeah. going to do it. But if and you have an are, argument as to why I should, let me know. And there are um, some very strong opinions on both sides um, <laughs> regarding Ryan Adams and his uh, potential cancellation. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it might cause you some unnecessary trouble and you don't yeah. want that. You want to go and have a good time with Karen and, yeah. you know, well, and Karen likes Ryan Adams too. It's just why we're going. So I don't right. want to make the event uncomfortable for her because exactly. I mean, we're going to Colorado from Kentucky and we're going on a trip for this thing. So, Exactly. It's not, it's not like I want to make her uncomfortable either. So I'll probably behave myself, which is a little counterintuitive to my personality, but I, I know that's hard for you. I know, I know, but you know what, it'll, it'll make you such a better person and <laughs> I'm sure Karen would appreciate it. Um, so yeah, let's yeah. just, let's just, let's just hold that all in. I generally follow the philosophy of uh, one of my favorite comedians, Tom Segura, who I think I mentioned on the, the previous okay. show. Uh, uh, he said once, and I totally identify with this. He is happiest when he makes everybody in the room slightly uncomfortable. I like that. That's, that's me. <laughs> you know, um, 
I think that's fitting for it you. Is. It is. <laughs> Welcome to Roots Music Rambler. She's Frank. He's false. And we're rambling on through the stories behind the music we love. And today on the show, we are going to be talking with Cindy Emch. I sure do hope I am pronouncing that correctly. Um, so Cindy is, well, hey, she's a singer-songwriter um, from the Secret Emchi Society. And i um, pretty excited to talk with her. Yeah, she. Uh, the, I've been doing some digging and listening to her music. And um, one of the things that I find really intriguing about her is uh, she is nicknamed the Queen of Queer Country. Love so. It. This is a, a, a probably a diversion from what a lot of people who uh, listen to country music or even roots music or, or Americana. It's a little bit different. It's a little out there on the fringes of what they're used to. But I have, have been enjoying her music. She's got some good tunes that are like traditional, just a traditional country sound. Yes, um, for sure. And so there's definitely some good music there. Um, but she does have a, a few songs that kind of push the envelope of the whole, I would, I would say the LGBTQ themes. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't want to use the word agenda cause I don't think that's it. No. I think she's just expressing her life in song and that's fine. But and she uh, has yeah, every right to do that. Absolutely. And it's going to be really interesting to hear her perspective on how that part of her, uh, person, uh, has affected her ability to succeed in the music world. Uh, especially in a genre that is not normally welcoming to things that are different. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it can be a fun and conversation. It, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. And, um, you know, there are some other artists who are kind of making their way as well, um, who would fall under that same category, maybe <laughs> not the queen of queer country, but, um, <laughs> Like a deem the artist. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with him falls, but um, actually, if you're familiar with them, um, excuse me for not using the correct pronoun, and I mean there that wholeheartedly. Um, so a deem the artist is pretty sure from North Carolina originally, and um, the songwriting is just fantastic. Very very catchy tunes, insightful lyrics. Um, I'm a big fan. Big fan. Yeah. Well, and, and, and this is one of those um, issues and topics that's going to continue to come up in the world that we're talking about. Uh, for those of you who have been living under a rock, uh, you may not know this, but the, um, the Tyler Childer, Childers music video uh, uh, to In Your in Love, your love. Uh, was a, if you haven't seen it, go watch it because it's an absolutely gripping, you know, sort of video story. Uh, written by Silas House uh, and his uh, husband, uh, Jason Howard. Uh, and Silas House, for those of you who don't know, is the Poet Laureate of Kentucky. He's a, a very successful author. Um, and they happen to be in a same-sex relationship. And they, the two of them collaborated on the screenplay, the script for that particular video, which I watched it and just was just blown away. It was so good. Um, and, and it was such a great way to communicate what we all feel if we had just heard the song and we we think about someone that we love and someone that we're um, in love with if we are heterosexual we think of that a certain way and we sometimes in fact most times probably don't think of love in a same-sex situation and to watch that video and to see it come to life on screen was really powerful. I immediately took my phone and handed it to my kids and said, watch this right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's um, it's like heartbreakingly gorgeous. Mm -hmm. The video, um, I, I was captivated the entire time and seriously brought to tears. And I, I think, and this will probably piss off some people, but whatever. But I think if a person watches that video and doesn't feel the slightest bit of sadness, compassion, yeah. something in along those lines, then that person probably isn't fully human. Yeah. Um, because uh, take away the characters, take away, replace them, replace one of them with a woman. So you do have that heterosexual relationship um, and people would be bawling all over the place. Right. Yep. Um, but the, 
at the core though is just this beautiful beautiful love story and frankly we need more of that in this world i don't care who's involved no doubt yeah if you if you watch that video and don't have a little bit of compassion a little bit of empathy just do us all a favor just stay home just don't go anywhere right we, nobody exactly. nobody needs to talk to you um by the way uh, uh also on today's show after we talk to cindy and of course we're going to talk about all this i'm sure uh, in more depth we are are also going to share our weekly pick in the grinning that's our last segment of the show where we share our picks for whose music is making us grin the most this week might be new artists might be old uh but they will all be good before we uh get to the interview and all that though um i do want to continue the conversation about Tyler Childers, we have to because since we last talked, his new album came out. And I want to know, Frank, A, have you heard it? I'll be ashamed of you if you haven't. And B, what you think? Well, A, of course, um, you know, it, I was eagerly awaiting its release, uh, just as I have been with all of Tyler's works um, since I first started listening to him, what, five, six, five years ago. Um, and yes, I listen to it and I, I dig it. I really do. <laughs> um, you know, so the, the thing is with Tyler Childers is that I found him, you know, after he released Purgatory, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a different album. Tyler was a different person. Um, that is not the same Tyler Childers who sings in your love. Um, so to appreciate him, you have to appreciate the evolution the, the metamorphosis that he has experienced as an individual and as an artist. And, um, you know, a lot of old school Tyler fans don't like his new stuff because it's too churchy or too <laughs> woke, you know, oh no, two men having a, you know, a relationship in, in a video, no way. You know, how could that be the same person who was, you know, talking about, we've been sniffing that cocaine right <laughs> um so you know um tyler is just so talented and i truly appreciate everything that he's gone through in life and that he has come out a better person um and i'm not judging him that way i i have a feeling he would agree with that he would mm -hmm. say that about himself yep. um <clears throat> He's just so talented and um, I really am enjoying Rustin in the Rain. It's a completely different sound from Purgatory and um, his older releases. Um, I love Percheron, Percheron Mules yep. and um, forgive me, I'm a city girl, Midwest city girl, so I'm probably <laughs> not pronouncing that correctly. Um, don't hate, but um, you know. <laughs> If you would love to correct my pronunciation, please do. I welcome that. Um, but that song is a jam. It yeah. is like, I really, really like that one. Well, and the, the, the album liner notes or whatever say that it's, it's inspired by Elvis Presley. And you can hear certainly that throughout the album. He actually even yeah. uh, does a cover of Help Me Make It Through the Night, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, but there's only seven songs on it. Um, and I'm going to have to dig a little bit more into this, but I saw some conspiracy theorist uh, post on TikTok this week saying, oh, this is a sign. Tyler's album only has seven cuts and the previous album had eight cuts and the, the previous albums had nine cuts. And, <laughs> oh, we're we're headed to the end of days for some bullshit. But um, OK, so so people can count. They can do math. Yeah, so they can do math. That's what apparently. we take from that. OK. I don't know. That's I, I'm going to I'm going to look into it, though, because apparently this person insinuated that even Tyler has made some sort of hint that there's there's some pattern to his album cut counts for some reason. I don't know what the hell it is, but uh, we'll we'll get into that. If I figure out something out or if I learn something about it, if you know something about it, send us an email and tell me. About it. But anyway, the album's great. I just really loved it. Um, I will say that. Uh, five of the songs immediately went to my sort of playlist that I put on in my, when I'm driving around um, five of the seven, um, the other that's, two will grow on me. That's a good percentage. Yeah. But five of the seven is pretty damn good. So if you're yeah. curious as to whether or not you should buy it, I am a Tyler fan, of course, fellow Kentucky boy got to represent. Um, but yeah, phone calls and emails is great. Um the Help Me Make It Through the Night cover is really good. Rest in the, rest in the Rain's great. Space and Time's outstanding. 
And that's the one where he, he's got S.G. Goodman and a couple of other folks uh, in there singing with him. And they did the Opry with him to sing it live. So isn't, a, isn't that an S.G. Goodman song? He covered her. It might, it might be. It might be. I don't Pretty know that sure. for sure. Um, I don't know if my liner notes have that on it, but uh, let's see if we can dial something up here. Uh, oh, my Lord. Well, we can hit the Google machine, right? We can hit the Google. Yeah, it's. I, I, you're. I think you're. You're right on that. Okay. And actually, S.G. Goodman. I think I mentioned this last week when I, or last time we talked. I'm going to I'm going to see her here in in Lousyville in November as well. Yeah, I know. So, so well, I'm, you're going to see a bunch of people that I'm not going to see. So calm down. I, <laughs> I got one. Well, wait. In the next month, I got two shows on the bill, but that's it. Well, it's. You know, one more than I've got. So we're in good shape. Mm. Uh, all right. We're uh, sipping on a bourbon. We're getting ready to uh, talk to Cindy Imch uh, when we come back after the break. Take a moment, if you will, listen to more about the awesome sponsors that help make this show happen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Roots Music Rambler. Uh. Wait, I got to, let me, I got to expand the frame here. Are you wearing a collared shirt? <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. This is, uh, what? What this, is happening? It's musk ox. It's I'm sorry, my, what? This is my musk ox flannel. Uh, I like them so much uh, that I actually asked them to let us be an affiliate. So technically they're a sponsor of the show now. Uh, so it's musk ox, and it's what I would call a premium flannel shirt. Uh, okay. They're not only comfortable. I mean, this is like this. I mean, yeah, if guys if, or gals, whoever, if you're wearing one of these musk ox flannel shirts and someone starts to rub on you, they're not going to stop. It's so Wait, soft. People are going to want to pet your shirt now and it. In addition to petting your beard, they can. It, it, it's a continuation. They can just do this. Look at that seamless, seamless. <laughs> it's like these shirts were made for you. They they really are. And here's what's funny. I'm a big dude, right? I mean, I'm a I'm I don't I don't mind telling people this. I wear a triple X shirt, and it's hard to find shirts, especially button up collared shirts that I feel comfortable in. Yeah. And and I, because of that and because I'm big and I get hot, I just don't wear flannel very often. Sure. Um, when the when it turns into the fall, I've got a couple of flannels that I've had for a while that are comfy that I'll put on. But I was introduced to musk ox by basically through the marketing channels that I spend my day job doing. Uh, and they were telling me about it. I was like, well, I'll order one and see if I like it. And I got this one the other day and I put it on. And first I was like, it fit, which is unusual. Uh, second, it's super soft and super comfortable. Um, and actually this shirt right over here, uh, if people will, will be able to see it at some point, um, they have different weights. So this is a heavy, oh. a, a thick flannel and that one's a, a lighter weight, thin flannel. Um, okay. And so like, it's just, it, it, they're, they're comfortable. They're very soft, so people will want to rub me, um, and I like. Is that what you need to do to get people I, to rub you? You got to wear a flannel. It's I take all the help I can get, so I just I like it when people <sighs> rub me. They rub me, and but this is this is it. Just feels really good. They're they're super comfortable. They're made to be durable and last a long time. They actually on their website say this is intended to be a shirt you can wear forever. Oh, um, and so it's I it, like that. Now, I will tell folks they're a little bit more expensive than, you know, you can, yeah. this is not a Target or a Walmart flannel. They're a little bit more pricey, but they're much better material. They last a lot longer. And here's the kicker. Um, and they sent me a card uh, with it to make sure that I remembered this. When you wear a musk ox flannel, $10 of every $100 purchase goes to wildlife conservation. So these guys are not only making great shirts, they're supporting the things that I like to support. Sure. And I think the show certainly gets behind. They donate to the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center. Uh, and so goes to support wildlife and the active pursuit of adventure, which is you know, all their brand stuff. But um, And the real reason uh, that I wanted to have them as part of the show, because something else I read on their website when I was shopping was, they say their shirts are buttery soft, 
but built like a tank. And just like I, you. And I can identify. Oh, just like you. Buttery wow. Soft, built like a tank. That's a Look. hell it's a hell of a tagline right there. No kidding. <laughs> wow. All right. So dig it. You need to go get you a musk ox. Uh, the, the website, we've got a special link for you. It's go muskox.com and that's g-o-m-u-s-k-o-x.com slash rambler that's pretty easy to remember go muskox.com slash rambler that'll take you to their website where you can browse the collection and then when you check out you use the discount code rambler all caps r-a-m-b-l-e-r and you get a discount i think it's like a 20 percent discount or something like that for being a wow. listener of the show so do all that get you some muskox and hashtag roam freely yo these things are so comfortable. I'm wearing flannel more. Oh, that, wow. All that right. Takes, that takes a lot for me because I don't like to be hot, but these are so smooth and the lighter weight ones are not as hot and I'm, I'm digging it. I murdered your bird. is a jam i love it i love <laughs> it oh my goodness that's murdered your bourbon by the secret mc society uh which really was uh, really founded is. by and is led by cindy Emch, and she's our guest today uh this week on roots music rambler cindy uh first of all thank you for writing murdered your bourbon uh, it's my favorite new song <laughs> i love it Thank you so much. I, I can't take sole credit. I wrote it along with uh, my good friend Mia Byrne and Kim Lembo. We actually, this is a hilarious story. We're just going to start off with a hilarious story. Oh, uh, we were <laughs> we were playing a house concert in Oakland, and it was before uh, folks had shown up. So we were just like, you know, having our pre-show beverages and chatting. And um, there was literally a bottle of Rebel Yell bourbon, and I poured it into my glass, and I was, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and then. Um, I looked at it and I was like, I murdered the bourbon. And then Mia looked at me and she was like, that's a song and starts like plucking on her mandolin. And we literally just made the words and the melody in 10 minutes in a room. And luckily after the first few notes in the mandolin, I grabbed my phone and I'm like, voice memo, voice memo right now. Don't, yes. don't lose it. And, and, and um, there's our show, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> that's it. That's the roots of like the best, well, not the best song of Secret MG Society, but a pretty damn good one. Um, Thank you. That's so, awesome. Yeah, it was pretty great. And then Mia and I uh, spent a bunch of time kind of just workshopping it to make sure that all of the verses and melody did what we wanted. And then I was happy. I was super lucky to have her on the recording too, which was really important to me because we'd really written the song together. And it was just, I love that song. It's, it's absolutely a barn burner. Great for the end of the night. Agreed. Encore song. Woo. People love it. I'll tell you what. So kids, if you're listening out there in radio land, the uh, lesson here is drink rebel yell and write music. <laughs> and always have your phone <laughs> handy to record it. So you don't lose it to yeah, the party. Or, or if you drink as much bourbon as I do, forget it. Cause you know, <laughs> <laughs> what was what? that last night? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so Cindy, I, I want to get, I want to talk about the album. I want to talk about a lot of different things. But what we try to do, uh, I think, best on this show is kind of dig into the person and understand a little bit more about you and where you're from and what mm -hmm. shaped your worldview so that we understand better what goes into your music. And so I guess the, the most logical place to start there is give us the origin story. Tell us where you grew up and, and, and how did you first find music? Sure. Well, I grew up in a rural town in Michigan. Uh, it was a farm town when I was growing up. Now it's much more of a strip mall town, but that that's a common American where, story. Where? Oh, if you want on the hand. Okay. Uh, wrong hand. All right. So <laughs> it's like here on the hand. It's in between. It's the midpoint between Lansing and Arbor and Detroit. But then also my grandparents lived in the upper peninsula. So they're oh, right yeah. in the, in the corner there of the thumb mm -hmm. in the, the Keweenaw Peninsula. So I spent oh, a lot Keweenaw. of time. I love the Keweenaw. Okay. The Keweenaw is wonderful, right? It's so good. Lake Superior absolutely Large. the best lake Whew. anyway <laughs> um but my mom always played accordion when i was a kid and so that was really part of my um intro to music i would 
sing along with her when she was practicing when I was just like a wee tiny child. And all of her old accordion books had songs from the 1920s, mm-hmm. right? Because she learned in the 50s. And so it's like, that's kind of how the cycle goes. And so I was lucky enough to grow up in the, you know, late 70s and 80s with this kind of great, like, building blocks of, like, 1920s cabaret music. <laughs> like, this is wonderful. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had the usual rock radio and, you know, things of that nature that come from just living in the Midwest. I remember in the 80s thinking that Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton weren't country because they run the regular radio. And yep. like, I didn't think Johnny Cash was country either. I was like, no, they're just regular. Like country is all like, I thought like Garth Brooks obviously was country, but so all the older traditional folks, I, cause I didn't grow up in a country family, but I heard it on a lot of the different stations. I was like, well, that's just good music. That's not right. country music. That's just good. Like there's no genre when it's awesome. It's just what it is. I love that. So that's awesome. I loved I mean, it's I thought it was hilarious later when I was like, I don't like country music. And people are like, but you love Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash and <laughs> Willie Nelson and Loretta Lynn and, 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 and I was like, well, that's not country. Oh, yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I just grown up with it all being like red cup, big truck was country and everything else was different. So yeah. When I feel I, uh, that. I really do. I feel that. Um, I totally get what you're saying. I didn't grow up in a country house. My goodness. I grew up in Little Italy in the middle of Chicago. Mm-hmm. We were not listening to country music, right? Right. <laughs> um, but I, so I kind of, you know, I can relate in that aspect. So I, I totally get what you say about, you know, Kenny Rogers, Willie Nelson. Like they were not yeah. country. They, they, and they were. They were really good at what yeah. they did. But, um, and the other thing I was going to say is I can totally hear that accordion influence in your music. So that is fantastic because I believe that the accordion just doesn't get the love that it deserves. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like right up there with the banjo, which is near and dear to my heart. So accordion, love it. I do have an accordion tattoo because I used to only be an accordion player. Oh, wow. So you play too. Okay, great. I do. I do. It it really messed up my back. So I now I mainly play guitar, but I I love the accordion so much. And I usually have some accordion on the record in some kind of way. Um, So yeah, I grew up in Michigan, you know, loving country music and not even realizing it. And uh, I grew up in kind of a pretty conservative and somewhat racist town. So my mom took us to Detroit a lot so that I would not grow up with those particular values, which was awesome. Awesome. And uh, when I moved to the West Coast, I was like, whew. <laughs> Different world. <laughs> made it, you know. Um, the, the people I grew up with were wonderful and the town was wonderful, but there were a lot of really horrible things about it, too. And so as a queer person, I just did not feel comfortable um, yeah. letting my freak, freak flag fly as much as I am inclined to back there. And so I did come to the West Coast pretty early right after college. And, you know, the rest is history. Well, formed a country band, started playing accordion, you know, all the usual. Yeah, all the usual <laughs> things for a queer person from Michigan. That's that's what that's what they do in it these days. <laughs> and I, I have think to so. ask, it's Cindy, the handbook. <laughs> where did you go to college? I went to Michigan State University. Yes! Yes! <laughs> so did I! <gasps> Wonderful. Did you listen to Impact Radio? Yes, of course. I was a DJ on Impact Radio. <laughs> That's actually where I heard uh, like Lucinda Williams and everything for the first time, because it was right when that Bloodshot Records insurgent country was coming out of Chicago and uh, Delilah's, right? Delilah's was one of the places. Yeah. And um, so the show that was on right before mine was this woman, Jamie's show. And it was the like, I don't remember what the name is. It was twang something, but it was like all the alternative insurgent country. And that's where I was like, she's actually the one who was like, child. Johnny Cash's country. Are you crazy? What is wrong with you? And like in a very loving and empathetic way, it was like, get your head on straight. Like you're crazy. And I was like, wait, and you're what you're playing is country too? Because this, I love this. Like what's happening? And so that actually going to Michigan State and working at Impact Radio actually totally broadened my whole brain. It's, I actually have that to credit for a lot of the, um, a lot of the taste making and like really influential music that I kind of have come to after I was a child. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, chalk one up for the Spartans. That <laughs> they is, win. Yeah. Spartans and that's why like 
when you said you're from Michigan and I already knew that, but I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, where? Because that's what everybody does. Right. Um, and then the, the UP or as my, <laughs> my 10 year old son used to say big Michigan and little Michigan. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I know my way around the state quite well. Yeah. Um, so that's awesome. Okay, cool. As, <laughs> and, okay. We can resume now. And I do oh. love Chicago as well so much. And I, I'm just going to say, cause this is a total tangent, but I have the exact same shirt you're wearing. Me or the Vandalier shirt? Yeah, the oh, Vandaliers. I opened for them at bottom of the hill over the summer and I bought no the shirt shit. and was like, Yes, I love this. They're such they're such wonderful people. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. goodness. Trying to get them on the show too. So um Josh and company for listening. Um, but I first saw Vandaliers. Funny you mentioned Bloodshot Records because it was their Bloodshot album release party mm -hmm. at the hideout in Chicago. Um <gasps> hideout. I it was I think it was twenty nineteen. 2019 mm -hmm. um and that was the first time i saw them live and i'm like i can't ever turn back now these guys are yeah. amazing they are um, wonderful and just so nice so so nice um so we've been lucky to see them a bunch of times in really small venues and you know been able to chat with them and stuff and mm -hmm. um they signed a poster for us it's i don't i don't think we have it up yet but um <laughs> um they signed my kid's mandolin. No, not, oh. no, no, not mandolin. It's a ukulele. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So they signed the ukulele and oh my God, I love them. They're wonderful. They gave me a great pull quote for their last record, actually. And I was just like, oh, they're just so nice. So supportive of other musicians in the scene too. Like, and I just, I can't say enough wonderful things about the Vandaliers. They're great. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear it. And they're really, <laughs> um, like diversity and inclusion and equality is really important mm -hmm. to them too. Yeah. Absolutely. The, la the last 10 minutes on the show has been proof that Jason Falls can shut the fuck up every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who this is great, knew? I'm, I'm glad you guys are connecting on, <laughs> on so many things. Now, I, I don't I don't mean to derail your uh, Michigan State love Whatever. party. Whatever. No, no, please, or let's go. It's fine. Love party. <laughs> but I, I want to get back to uh, the the accordion for a moment. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to I'm going to show some real ignorance here. Uh, because, uh, I've, I mean, obviously I know what the accordion is, but I would imagine from what I know, which is limited, I'm admitting that up front. Okay. Cindy, did you grow up listening to and learning polka music? Because that's what I associate the accordion with. Not at all. It was songs like, um, the man on the flying trapeze. Okay. Like that's an example of the kind of cabaret vaudevillian style music. It was also, there was that like Daisy, give me your answer. Do like. There's all, you know, there's all these old, gotcha. you know, 20s kind of melody songs. Now, that being said, my wife loves the, the beer barrel polka. And when we got, when I got, when she, when I started playing the accordion again, it was while we were already together. And she was like, you have to learn it. Learn the beer. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know how to play a polka. And she's, I'm like, I just know how to like make my own songs that are kind of like dirgy and murder ballad. I'm sorry. And she's like, <laughs> learn the beer barrel polka. Like, love murder ballad songs. I, yeah, I I still don't know how to play a polka. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm not wired that way. Although no hate for polka in this heart. Like I do, I can enjoy it. I just is not uh, something that I am naturally inclined to performing. Well, I, I mean, I you know I grew up at the same about the same time you did, seventies mm -hmm. and eighties, and my exposure to music outside of you know real radio country music back then, because I grew up in a similar town to you, probably rural mm -hmm. town in eastern Kentucky, uh, so very limited worldview. There was a country station, there was an adult contemporary station, yeah. Um, and when I was real little, the my exposure to music was on shows like the Lawrence Welk show, so I got a lot of polka and um, hee haw. Uh, you know, and some of those mm -hmm. variety shows that were on back then when, and this was when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. Um, but when I really started to understand what the polka was, it actually was sort of in a tongue in cheek way because my exposure to most polka music outside of Lawrence Welk was Weird Al Yankovic. Who and is wonderful. Absolutely. And he's great live too. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever seen him live. He's fantastic. Yes. So, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Your, so your mom played the accordion. Mm -hmm. um, d tell us more about your growing up, your childhood beyond music. So what did your mom do? Mm -hmm. what, did, what, what was the family situation like? How did you, what shaped your worldview? Well, my mom was a gym teacher and my dad was an accountant and we lived in a house that um, on two sides was bordered by um, what I thought was national forest. Turns out it was just undeveloped land. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, 
Because yeah. now there's all these condos built on it and it's just like all the forest is gone, which is super sad to me. But so I spent a lot of my childhood running around the woods with my dog. You know, we had a we had a larger we had one dog that lived in the house. It was like my mom's dog who like was a smaller poodle. But we also had like a, a Malmute Husky wolf mix. And so I was allowed to go in the woods by myself as a girl if I had the big dog with me. So mm. that dog got a lot of exercise because, you know, <laughs> freedom as a girl child is kind of hard to come by. And I was really in to being like a little Can't one confirm. I was like, I'm like, let me out of here. I want to go run around in the trees and like, you know, tear up my jeans and get all beat to hell just like any other kid would. And so... I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, we also uh, lived near a, a city public lake. And so my family, uh, we had at different times, we had a rowboat and a sailboat once for a minute until my mom and I sank it. Um, <laughs> it's a different story. Um, and uh, like and a, like a like a ski boat, like a straightforward ski boat. And so we would take, especially in the summers, because my mom was a teacher, we'd spend 99% of the time on the lake. Like we'd go uh, to one of those berry picking farms in the early oh, yeah. part of the day, pick a bunch of fruit for the day, and then go to the library, get some books, and then take the boat onto the water and just be on the water and like swim or, wow. <clears throat> you know, what, like take my friends water skiing or like make campfires. There's like one island on the lake and then families would like grill corn or hot dogs or whatever on a fire there. And so that was a lot of how I spent my childhood was in the woods, in the water, and then also in a book. Like that was my third passion. I just, I love to read. I still do. I read like a nerd all the time. And I remember one of my favorite things to do as a kid is I would, again, looking for the girlhood independence, I would climb the tree in our backyard. So I'd be about two stories up with my book and, and a, usually a can of pop. And I would sit in the tree and read for three hours. Wow. I don't have to talk to anybody if I'm up there. And that was wonderful. So <laughs> I loved it. And my mom could always just check and like, she'd look outside and be like, oh, you're still in the tree. <laughs> All right. So that we, sounds we have, we wonderful. Have to ask, it was great. We, we have to follow up and ask, tell us about the sailboat sinking story. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was a really, it was a very straightforward sailboat. Like I think it was homemade by somebody. Um, I think we, my parents bought it for like a hundred dollars maybe. And I seem to remember the boat part was like, basically was a glorified canoe that had kind of had a pole <laughs> bolted to it somehow. And, um, so we're trying to take it across the lake and, you know, it's not light and buoyant, like so many sailboats now where you could just like try to get it back up in the air. So it goes over cause there was a wind and we didn't know how to work a sailboat and, um, then, you know, my dog came in the room and then, uh, you know, water got on the sail, started dragging it down <laughs> and then it just kept going and soon it was an upside down sailboat. And so we just kind of looked at it and we're like, and this is, you know, before cell phones and all that. So we've both got safety, uh, life jackets on cause we're, we know how to swim, but we're like, we've never sailed a sailboat before. And we, uh swam the sad upside down sailboat over to the shore which was probably i don't know like <laughs> uh, 1200 feet something I don't know. it wasn't close but it wasn't crazy far and then yeah i don't know if she, my mom got like the neighbor on the shore to call my dad or what but like eventually i saw that sailboat like dragged up onto the shore of like a neighbor who had lake access as part of their house and uh it just sat there for like years. <laughs> That's oh, funny. sad, sad, soggy sailboat. Well, I, 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 the 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 sad saga of the up, upside down sailboat sounds like an album title to me. Right? <laughs> I know, right? I've been thinking soggy about sailboat. doing. I've been thinking about doing a whole album of songs about like different elements of the Michigan experience, including the Upper Peninsula, and like I think the upside down soggy sailboat's one of them. There it's you gotta go. Be, right. That's, it's that gotta be sounds. There. That sounds like a fabulous idea. I love that. I love that. <laughs> All right. So learning to play accordion with your mother and then mm -hmm. college radio DJ, mm -hmm. what was the in-between? Were you marching band? Were you piano, guitar? Where did, where did that musical journey take you? I was dance class and choir. Okay. That was me. So we had, we actually had a good dance school in my town, which is weird. 
but like the the um just because small towns and dance schools often like don't have they're, they're just kind of often like kind of regular like you have kids you teach them how to tumble like some basic ballet classes but we actually had um like we, our school went to dance competitions and everything like that so i became a pretty big nerd for like ballet and modern dance and um that introduced me to a lot of dance music that I wouldn't have otherwise heard. The daughter of the woman who owned the dance school had just um, moved to Broadway for like five years to try to make it as a professional dancer. And so then she came back to teach when things weren't going great. And she brought back all this wonderful music from like what was a very vibrant and artsy downtown scene in New York in the 80s. And I was like, what's all this now? And then, like, you know, it was a lot of, you know, stuff that like later would be defined as like new wave and alternative. And you're just like, what's happening? Cause like, you just don't hear that uh, in that town. And then um, right around that time, also um, some folks who later became friends of mine uh, started a radio show on our local radio station, which was called WHMI. And um, they had a, a program called voice after eight. And what it was is there was normal, like adult contemporary programming um, from I think 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then news from like 6 to 8 and then they just kind of like went off air or like just played like some kind of loop of something and so these DJs who loved new wave and alternative and insurgent country and all this they were like hey let us have our own little show after 8 p.m. it'll go like 8 to midnight or 8 to 10 like whichever is okay and they played things like Billy Bragg and Suzanne Vega black flag um the cure like you know all these uh, voice of the beehive transvision vamp like all like you know the swans like all this stuff that <laughs> i was like wait and, and what's this now and then probably yeah. like a couple of years after that i heard about 120 minutes and i was like wait and what's this now and i didn't have cable because like for a while we couldn't afford it so i had friends who had vcrs and i'm like here's a tape tape <laughs> like just do it <laughs> and then I would just like get the tape back. I still have one of them, like my favorite one, like the one that has all the really good songs on it. Wow. It's still like over on my counter and I still have a VCR and I will play that thing when I am homesick. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I want to see the swans again. Come on. <laughs> Give me some 1987. I want it. It's wonderful. That's fantastic. So about the same time, uh, here's my embarrassing story. Cause uh, apparently my hometown was not the same as, as your hometown. Because about the same time, I marched my b big dumb butt into the radio station in my hometown at 14 years old and said, I want to mm -hmm. be a DJ. And they said, oh, you start Friday. And so I was a disc jockey in high school, but I asked for permission on Friday nights after the local football or basketball game was over. Mm -hmm. Let me do nine to midnight. And mm -hmm. I and it was a, an adult contemporary station. And they let me play. A show. I did a show called Friday Night on the Rocks. And I would play hair band music basically um, because that's what I was into. And that's what the yeah. kids that I went to school with were into. And so I did the whole, you know, Bon Jovi, Skid Row, Winger, Warrant. That was, poison. that was my, my high school poison. poison. That was my high school life right there. So I'm oh, not, yeah, I have the, I have like a first edition of that first poison record. I think I wore it out. I love yeah. it. I bet. I bet. Well, that, that was, that was, yeah, that was an, an interesting time in, in rock music. Mm -hmm. And, and then of course grunge came along and killed it all, but that was, which is fine. It probably needed to die, but whatever. <laughs> it was time. <laughs> it, was time. <laughs> it, it was time. So when, when in the, the evolution of all this, I mean, obviously if you were doing, you know, uh, college music, college DJ, college radio mm -hmm. station, DJing music was a path for you. When did you figure out that you wanted to do this for a living in some form or fashion? Well, one of the things was that I was, you know, as a DJ through my entire four years of college and, you know, I was like, Ooh, is that, is that a possibility? And it was kind of like, Oh, you know, it didn't seem like a way that I could actually pay my rent and or get out of Michigan. So I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to back burner that for a little while. And, you know, I always thought that I would love to be the singer in a band. And I'd been playing guitar since I was like 16 years old. And I taught myself from an old Leonard Cohen and a Tom Waits songbook because I had a job at a boat launch. And I was like, I'm bored all the time. I'm just going to play my guitar, figure it out with the tar tablature. <clears throat> but I always thought, because I'd never seen anyone that looked like me actually play the kind of music I liked. I was like, well, that's just not going to, that's always going to be a hobby job for me, right? It's always going to be like a passion project, a vanity project, whatever. And there weren't things like 
there weren't the the different like digital distribution or streaming yeah. services and i was like i don't know anything about like get a label get a band who what the no it's uh, whatever and so when i moved to california my first experience was living in a house with a punk rock band and they were like no you can actually sing like you should you should have a band and i was like well maybe i want a band with you guys and they were like well we have a band and i was like damn, damn it you're not um, invited in <laughs> i was their videographer uh me and my partner at the time but you know not not as a band member and then so, you know, later when we would all be drinking bourbon, um, there were always all these like debates about like a future side project that me and the guitarist would have about maybe it would be like a jazz combo because I actually really, really love jazz, like big jazz nerd um, also. And so we're also, maybe a jazz combo, maybe a country band. And then we were like, country band, that's crazy. And as we all know, every punk rock singer from the 80s and 90s has now become a country musician. And he was no exception. We, in the early 2000s, formed a country band called Rhubarb Whiskey. <laughs> it was like, oh, here we go. And that, I think, um, that early 2000s moment was the first time I've formed two bands at the same time, uh, Rhubarb Whiskey and Vagabondage. And they were both like Americana slash country bands. Rhubarb Whiskey was more of a murder ballad band and Vagabondage was more like sea shanty stompy band. But um, I realized like, wait, I actually am a good songwriter. I'm totally holding my own with musicians I really respect who have been doing this a lot longer than me. And this is really fun. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it. I'm like, I'm, I'm all in. And I mean, yes, there have been times where I've been like a, a pirate radio DJ or I was a DJ for uh, Gimme Country for a while. And I also like have worked at like Pandora in the music curation space and Yahoo in the music curation space. So I never really let go of the dream of music being everything <laughs> because that's just how my brain works. But these days it's I actually find it really refreshing because my day job's like a separate entity. And so my art life gets to just be about this um this material and this art that i care so much about and i just feel really really lucky that people pay me to do it and like let me do it with other really cool people like the vandaliers and sarah shook and like mia Byrne and other just people that i adore that i respect so much and they're like hey come share a stage with us and i'm like really Whoop. and i just i still get really excited about it all the time it's it's a it's just quite a delight very cool. Sounds We're talking like to Cindy Imch from the uh, Secret Imchi Society. Uh, she mentioned a minute ago that she noticed that there weren't a lot of people who looked like her playing the music she liked. When we come back after the break, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So don't go away. This is Roots Music Rambler. I like this. That's uh, My Old Flame from uh, Secret Emchi Society, and uh, Cindy Emch is with us. Uh, real quickly, uh, Cindy, before we uh, get into the next little segment, and we're going to talk sure. about the album, too. I'm just curious, uh, what kind of name is Emch? I've never heard that before. So the best theory I've come up with using, you know, the Ancestry.com and all that good stuff is that it was actually a German slash Austrian name that was Emmerich and that Ellis Island was like, that is way too many vowels. Let's just take them all away and give you a short name that no one can pronounce and kind of sounds like you're sneezing. How's that? And, you know, apparently they were there like, cool, go. just let us in, you know, so that that's great. So that's what I think is going on there. Yeah, welcome to America. Uh, Here's man. your sneeze name. That's <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the backstory on that, and that makes perfect sense. I would just—it's not a name that I had ever heard, and I was like, yeah. hey, "Where's that from?" So anyway, yeah, most so, people haven't, and that's why the the why got added. Because when I was a performing uh, poet around town, one of the MCs was like, "I cannot pronounce your name, so I'm just going to add a Y. It'll rhyme like kimchi. <laughs> is that right? Am she like kimchi?" And I was like. That works. That works. And then it just stuck. <laughs> and I was like, well, people do seem to be able to help. It helps them pronounce it with the extra Y on it. So I'm like, sure, 
Let's go. Very nice. So in the previous segment, we were talking and you said that in your, in your music life, especially mm-hmm. uh, as you started to perform and whatnot, you recognized that there weren't very many people that look like you playing mm-hmm. the kind of music you like. Now, yes. I think we've kind of circled around the kind of music you like, and there've been some allusions to people who look like you, but tell us your experience of mm-hmm. what do you look like for people who don't know? And and, and where did that mm-hmm. come from? Well, you know, there, there's a few different elements to my personality type. Um, while I am a white person who is femme presenting, so there's a lot of uh, privilege I get in the world walking that way, I also am a plus size person, and that has been true since I was seven years old and had a tonsillectomy. After that, just I'd been, I went from being a sickly child to being a chubby child, and that never has really changed. And also, I tend to have a lot of tattoos. I used to have more piercings than I do now, but still, like I definitely, for better or worse, had a bit of a punk rock aesthetic. And um, my hair has been cherry red since time before time this is shockingly not a natural color but you know i think if i had a different color at this point people would be like who are you and why are you in my friend cindy's house um and so just seeing i mean first of all seeing plus size people at all as the front people of bands male or female is not super common and it's even less common for women quite honestly and then even less common for women in the country industry uh or americana industry so that's that alone was um It was a real struggle, actually, because I mentioned before that I'd been a dancer a lot in high school, and that was true. And I was always, you know, I was very thin for me at the time, but I was still on the very plus end of what a dancer's body would look like. And that I really kind of took in and believed a lot of the social stuff about like, well, unless you lose a lot more weight, there's no place for you on Broadway. There's no place for you as a professional dancer. There's no place to even like entertain this as a passion hobby because you just don't fit. And thankfully, like there have been a lot of people that have broken those boundaries that like had the um, the wherewithal and the swagger to be like, that is not true. I'm going to go do that. And they have made it a much um, not I wouldn't say an easy path, but I'll say a path that has examples in it so that, you know, kids who are coming up now are like they don't have that same like I'm not allowed moment. Um, While I did take in the messages of I'm not allowed for the dance and the Broadway moments. Um, my friends that I formed those first bands with did not let me get caught up in my own, uh, ego or insecurity or fear. And they were just like, you're just playing music with us. Shut up and do it. And then it was like, uh, and I'm a bit of a hustler. Like I can't help it. Like if we have songs, I'm like, well, no, we need to play them for somebody. And so as soon as we had songs, I was booking a shows (laughs) and it just like went from there because I can't make art and not share it. Because I feel like that's a crime. And when I know artist friends who are like making art and then it just all like lives in their hard drive or, you know, on their walls, but is never shared. I'm like, you're taking something away from the world. Like you're taking some something really beautiful that you're doing and you're you're robbing people of it. And I've had times where I was like, no one needs to hear my stuff, like whatever. And usually somehow i'm like universe is this you i don't know um but whenever that happens i usually have some show where it's like kind of small and intimate and i'm like oh, i'm tired i'm not feeling it and then after i do the set i have somebody come up to me and they're like crying and they're like oh my god this meant so much and uh you know and like it just really i've actually had people say it was life-changing i had somebody say i want to meet you next time you're in town and play the tuba with your set and i'm like i sure i am i'm up for it like let's do it because I really, um, I just love that people want to like share and be part of it. I'm like, you got to learn the notes first, but yes, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> like you're, don't just come up here and like scronk, but like, otherwise a hundred percent, let's do it. You know? Um, and <clears throat> I just think that art is such an important and delicate and vulnerable and wonderful thing to share that when I make mine, I can't shut up about it. And when other people make theirs, I don't want them to shut up. Like I want to like spread the word and shine the light and boost up all of the art of, of people that I know that they make. Cause I think it's just wonderful. And I think that's how we make a better world, not to sound like a naive weirdo, but like, I think <laughs> that if we honestly like open heartedly share things that are important to us with an open heart, I think it can really help us be connected regardless of what our other personal opinions are about things. Amen. Love it. It's good Thanks. stuff. 
<laughs> so I'm curious also too. one thing that yes. you, and I don't know if this was an intentional or not, but one thing that you didn't touch on in that answer was your uh, LGBTQ experience, at least right, not very deeply. <laughs> well, no, and, but, but that Oops. actually, that, that actually sets up this question though, because I wanted Great. to ask, you know, your music as I've gone through and listened to the last few albums, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that life that surfaces in your music. So yeah. I'm curious what your story is of being comfortable with telling the world who you really were. That never felt scary to me. <clears throat> is that true? Hold on. I want to make sure I'm not lying. Um, when I was a teenager, okay, <laughs> you're going to hear the hilarious real story. Now this is great. <laughs> All right. So when I was a teenager, I had this theory. I knew uh, what gay men were, although I did not understand, but I like knew of my, okay, that man is kind of foppy and fabulous and he doesn't date girls. I didn't, I hadn't done the extra math. You know, there were not a lot of um, examples in the culture that I was exposed to, to know more of what that meant. Right. Like I thought Charles Nelson Riley from the game shows was amazing. And, you know, like, um, but I, I just didn't have more than that. And when I thought I, I didn't have a word for lesbian and I actually had this whole theory worked out in my head that um, men and women could be best friends and they got together to have kids, but they didn't really like each other a lot. And so all dudes like went off with their best friends to drink beer and have their romantic relationships with them because that's how they do their male bonding. That's the whole dude thing. And all women went off with their best friends to have their lady romantic relationships. And that was just really natural and how everything worked. And then the couples, like the men and wife were just together to like have their kids and be best friends and like raise a household. And that's just how it worked. And I didn't think that anything had a separate name. And that's just how the world worked. That was my whole theory. And then I went to college. I understood. I learned very quickly that what I was talking about was not actually how it worked at all. And, um, and I mean, mind you, I knew my friends had like romantic crushes on boys and stuff. I didn't think that like, you know, that was verboten or never happened. I just didn't think it was that common. <laughs> and I don't know how, I mean, I got those ideas because in my brain, it wasn't that common, right? Like the, the men that I saw that I was attracted to or thought were cute. That was always the exception to the rule. Whereas like the girls, I was like, hi, like my first crush was on Lily Tomlin in nine to five. Like, I am not even going to front. I was like, can I watch that again? Can That's I, good. Can, I, can we watch that again? Dolly Parton's amazing. I love her, but Lily Tomlin. Oh my God. Just, oh my God. So when I uh, when I went to college and I realized, oh, the gay, I uh, realized that that was me. And um, I was identified as bisexual for a long time because I had a male partner for about seven years. Um, and he was very supportive of the like figuring out my gay and like pursuing it down the road and like really uh, being comfortable with who I am. And I think that having that support network really allowed me to not be scared of who I was or being really like stomp my foot pay attention to me i don't care if i am like femme and look like a straight girl i am not and uh, I'm, I'm part of this community and you're gonna make space for me and uh for better or worse i always had an experience where the gay men in the community of east lansing and lansing uh, made a lot more room for me than the lesbians did um but there were a few that were really nice to me at the lesbian bar once or twice when i showed up in my like hilarious goth new wave outfit and was like <laughs> Why does everyone here look like they were just at a softball game? I don't know what to do. And, but it turns out they had just been at a softball game and they'd won. And like, I didn't know how to talk to them because my family's all sporty. And I was like, I'm not that. And so I was all like rejecting sportiness. But then there's all these wonderful sporty lesbians. Be, and I was like, I don't know what to do here. And so they were really nice because I was by myself because I didn't have anyone else to go with. And uh, they came over and they're like, honey, we're going to get you a beer. And what are you looking for right now? And I was like, I just wanted to dance at a gay bar. I don't know what's going on. And they were like, okay, so you need to go to Club Paradise down the street and like ask for like this dude. He will be kind and introduce you to some people. You can hang out with us as long as you want, but I don't think that we're who you want to hang out with. And I was kind of like, looking around like, oh, is anyone cute? And I mean, I might want to hang out. But then I went to the other <laughs> bar because they were all like 15 years older than me. And when I was... 20 with a fake ID. That was a lot. So <laughs> I moved along. <laughs>
<laughs> I love it. Well, I, let me say your, uh, your, I guess, ideal of what was going on before you understood the real world. Wouldn't we have a better world if everybody thought that way and, and that's how the world existed? And because, actually lived that way? Holy yeah. moly, that would solve I mean, a lot of problems. It was just about like everyone figures out how to like each other and get that what they need from different relationships. I don't, my teenage brain was very idealistic. I was like, this is great. What? <laughs> what? What's wrong? And then, yeah. The so, gay. <laughs> the gay. So, <laughs> as I mentioned, the the gay lifestyle, if you will, the LGBTQ experience comes out mm -hmm. in your music, no pun intended. Um, and, um, but I, I'm wondering if, I'm wondering how intentional that is because it sounds to me like it's very intentional that you are baking that experience into your music as some way of representation. But I want to ask you that question. Mm -hmm. Is it intentional or is it just a byproduct of who you are? Uh, it's a little bit of both. I'll say for the first three records, it's uh, pretty much accidental. Like if I'm writing a love song, I'm clearly going to write it to my wife because that's who is my romantic partner who I love like more than anything. So, um, you know, pronouns in love songs, I feel like are just a byproduct of who I am. And like they're not baked in and they're not trying to say anything extra does it give uh, representation to some folks who might be like, oh, wait, this is written for me too? Yes, and that's awesome. Um, but also, like, it, there's a long history in country music of people singing each other's songs and gender kind of being thrown out the window for it. So, like that, I um, I actually felt kind of bad and got a little bit of flack from people for not making the music more political or gayer. And I was <laughs> like, well, I'm... I'm trying, but every time I try to write a song that's like brick over the head gay, it's like not good. <laughs> there were some real bad songs on the cutting room floor. Let me tell you, I was like, woof. Um, but then when I was making this last record and um, I'd kind of been looking around for some really kind of fun songs to do. And I was like, oh, what if I did that old, you know, Willie Nelson? Turns out it's Ned Sublette, but, you know, that old song cowboys are frequently secretly fond of each other and i had like a cover of it that wasn't very exciting i was like oh i'm just playing guitar and like singing it and it sounds a lot like the original and mm, i don't know and then i was talking to um one of my uh, best musician friends and chosen brothers up in canada mr tolan mcneil who actually produced the record and i was like i think i want to cover this song and i don't i almost never cover songs on my records this gold country country gold is a little different because i had songwriting partners or a couple of people who gave me songs that that hadn't happened before and i was like oh these are beautiful i want to do that um but usually 99 percent of the record is all mine and then occasionally there's a co-write here and there um so deciding to kind of put such a iconic cover on it i was like well if i don't make this sound like my own then i'm not gonna do it and we were able to make it sound like some real gay goth country. Let me tell you what, like it is quite, I was like, I want it to sound like a Western soundtrack from like 1945, but then with like Nick Cave in it. Right. And so I feel like we got there and I feel like um, in some ways that feels like ironically, like one of the most more political songs I have because it's so um it's very in your face, but it's also hilariously one of the most traditional old school country songs that's on the record because the song is, you know, a, not new. So I thought that was kind of funny at the same time. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm glad you kind of called out the the sound of that song is very distinct and very different from the other cuts on the album. And I'm glad you called that out because I was actually going to ask if that was intentional. Obviously it was. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's, it's definitely a, it gives you a different feeling than the other songs on the album. Mm -hmm. Was that a concern at all to have something that was so, so much of a juxtaposition from the other cuts? Um, not too much. I, I really tried to think of it as a, as a continuation of a theme, like for the last few records, and the next one's no exception. Um, I have this description of the soundscape of the record that I always give to whoever the producer is. And it's always been uh, Tolan. And this time I'm trying someone new who's more local so we can kind of mess around with stuff earlier. But um, it's the sound of if David Lynch and Ennio Morricone met in a, go in a bar in a ghost town on the Wild West Coast, that's what these songs would sound like. They'd be playing at that bar. <laughs> and so, you know, like any roadhouse bar in, that, in a ghost town on the Wild West Coast with David Lynch and Ennio Morricone hanging out at it, uh, the mood of the songs is going to change. The vibe will change depending on what part of the night you're in. And But I really try to think of it as um, 
what that night would sound like as a as a bar band like with your set list like what would your ideal be and that's kind of how i try to approach the album like we're the soundtrack for this night at a at a bar in a twin peaks episode Let, let's go what's gonna happen <laughs> what was it one eye jacks uh one eye jacks was the one across the border where the girls got in trouble but i think okay. it was the triple r roadhouse the double R oh, roadhouse was the one double where, R, where I think it's double R where uh, all the bands played. And when they did the, uh, the revival of the show, like Eddie Van, not Eddie, Van, <laughs> Eddie Vetter <laughs> did, did a set there. Real different Eddie's. Oh my God. Totally. Can you imagine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I just, I'm having a picture in my head of Eddie Van Halen doing that set. And I'm like, Whoa, that's strange. Anyway, does not compute. <laughs> does not. David Lee Roth, maybe that would make a little, like, I feel like he could get there, but sure. Eddie Van Halen, I'm just not. Sure. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> not to start a feud. No, no, right, right, right. We're, that's not what we're about here. No, we're, we no love feuds. everyone. No feuds. So I want to ask you about, um, and, and, and the, the, the album, uh, that is, it's, it's, uh, gold country, country gold. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's been out for, I think about a year or so, but it's available yeah. all over the place. So yes. people out there listening, we'll put links in the show notes. So you gotta go, mm -hmm. gotta go download all that good stuff. I want to ask you about a, another album that you did because the concept of this album, like immediately jumped out at me and was like this, you're going to love this. And I did, mm -hmm. I loved every cut on it. Um, and that was, um, uh, Mark's yard. Um, I and, knew that's the one you were going to say too. I was like, Ooh, concept album. I know which one this is. Well, I mean, and, and, and maybe that's obvious, I, but I just, I literally, I saw the name of the album and I thought this has got to be her and her friends sitting around a campfire, raw recording in Mark's backyard. I'm assuming that's what it was. Is that correct? Uh, pretty much. And the Mark in question is my friend Carolyn Mark, who's a, a singer. Uh, she's a Canadian Amer Canadian country singer um, up in uh, Vancouver Island. And she is a wonderful gatherer of people to her. Like she just has this wonderful crew of humans. And so every time I've gone up there to tour with her, it's been amazing because there's always the late night you know, okay, all the shows are over. We're so sick of seeing other people. Like we love the audience, but oh my God, I haven't seen you in 10 years or five years or whatever since we were last on tour. And so everyone just shows up wherever she lives and there's one guitar and it usually gets passed around for about three hours. I will tell you, this is why box wine exists because yep. you have this many musicians in a room. Like you cannot go with just bottles because it does not work. <laughs> um, but yeah. And like from usually like what? midnight to 4 a.m. and then you're like okay I think we're done and everyone of course because it's Canada everyone's smoking and I'm just like I can't I need to go to bed now but also <laughs> this is the best moment of my whole life I don't want it to ever stop so uh one of the things I wanted to do with that record it was really make a love song like the whole album is a love song to those nights and to my friendship with Carolyn um, but also some of the songs on it are written by the people that would be in those song circles who don't have record deals or haven't had their music um, popularly uh, exposed. Right. And so I really wanted to take a swing at playing some of these songs that for this group of friends, everyone knows them. Everyone knows the words. And they're like these iconic songs like Monkeys in the Zoo is one like I, the first time I heard that song. The, uh, my friend Dave Lang wrote it. I, he put down the guitar and I like went up to him and I'm like, you are my friend. This is true forever. That song was amazing. And like, I wouldn't <laughs> let him not talk to me for like 10 minutes. Cause I was just blown away by it. And I wanted there to be an opportunity for more people in the world to hear some of those songs. And, um, that was really precious to me. And so what we did here in Oakland was we went to my neighbor's backyard and I tried a few different mics. We ended up with a, a a fat head condenser mic being the the main one mic in a room thing and so we set up outside and did all the basic tracks for the songs um using a um what do we use like one of those zoom not zoom like the meeting but like a zoom recorder mm -hmm. um that was set to multi-channel to capture it and then we had i sent all of those tracks to my Canadian musical family. And I was like, can you please do backing vocals and screwing around this on these? Because <laughs> I got, I got all the basics of 
singing and, and instruments and screwing aroundness on the ones from Oakland. And now like it won't feel right unless the whole community of people that inspired this is part of the record. And so wow. they did that. They set up in someone's kitchen. I got photos sent of it. It was hilarious. They had like a huge, they like connected a computer to a large screen television monitor that someone found on the street seriously put it on top of the refrigerator so they could all see the words so they knew how to sing a lot like what the backing like the which parts they were supposed to sing and then they just put a microphone in a room they taped it to the legs of an upside down chair <laughs> and there was a lot of bourbon apparently and uh i got the tracks and i was like this is perfect and also yeah. what the hell did you guys just do up there but it was wonderful, and I, I think it made a really good record. The The person who mixed it for me was like, I hate you. <laughs> but, um, but you know, it all worked out. Well, I, I love it, and, and I'll tell you why I love it. Because my earliest real memories of roots music, Americana music, country music, mm -hmm. were Friday nights. My mom and stepdad would go to a friend's house. Uh, Larry mm -hmm. and Cheryl Webster were their names. Uh, and well, are, are their names. They're not dead. They're still around. Um, <laughs> and uh, they would gather their friends and it would be just a, you know, a picking and grinning session, you know, guitars, mm -hmm. mandolins, you know, stand up bass, sometimes an electric bass, a uh, couple banjos, some fiddle players, and they would just sit around and sing mostly traditional mountain music. Mm -hmm. But a little bit of everything. There'd be some Willie in there. There'd be some Waylon in there. There'd be some Loretta in there. Um, and they would, the adults would sit around and sing. And then me and, and Todd, uh, um, um, Mickey Todd and, and uh, Scott, Larry and Cheryl's kids and the other kids that were there would, you know, run around. But I would always kind of stop and listen for a while. Yeah. And those were my earliest memories of just people enjoying music, not going to a concert, but playing mm -hmm. themselves and singing along with other people. And those are some really precious memories for me and really yeah. impressionable uh, memories as well. And so when I heard that record, when I saw the name of it, I thought, yeah. I bet that's what it is. And when I started playing it, I was like, it, the memories just came flooding back. Like I oh, could I see, that. I could see Denver Andrews sitting over in the corner playing bass, you know, in, in, in your, in your mm -hmm. world. And yeah. it was just like this mind meld of things. And so that's why I love the album so much is it just brought back some good memories for me. <laughs> I love that. I mean, that's exactly why I made it. I wanted to invite other people into the room and into that experience. And like, it is such a precious moment, right? Like I have some, a few memories from my childhood of being at um, my great aunt's house with my grandmother and, and they would do the same thing. They had like a, an organ in the room, but everybody would sing along and it was all like, you know, traditional and country music. And uh, there, there's nothing more precious than those memories of making music with other people in a live environment. And I, st I feel that way to this day when I get to, you know, see my Canadian friends or my friends down here in Oakland where we can just jam and, you know, band practice is great, but like just the, the picking and grinning jams, like where everyone's just screwing around and singing and like, it's just so full of love, right? Yeah. It's just like, it's, you're so connected to each other and it's just really wonderful. Very much. I'm going to take us to our, 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 another break here with um, my favorite song from that album. And I'm going to be the dumb, predictable guy who doesn't know shit about music and play the one song that probably everybody in the world has probably heard from that one. Uh, but let's take that to a break. And when we come back, I want to ask you a few more things about uh, uh, the being LGBTQ in the country music business, which I think is an important conversation. So uh, here's a little, uh, here's a little, uh, Mark's yard for you. Yeah. So raw, I love it. I got a good woman at home. Things I do no wrong. Sometimes the Lord, she just ain't always around. Get a whiskey band hell bound Play me some songs about a rambling man With a cold one in my hand <laughs> Welcome back to Roots Music Rambler. That is Whiskey Bent from the Secret MG Society uh, from the album Mark's Yard, the Campfire Covers. And Cindy Imch is with us. Cindy, uh, tell us a little bit about how... A Hank Williams Jr. song made it on this album. 
<laughs> well, you know, I play that song live sometimes, and I always introduce it by saying that Hank Williams Jr. made it awesome, and I made it super, super gay. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like total props to him for it's a wonderful song. It's so well written. It's so, it's just great, right? Like no one's going to ever argue that. And I was like, oh, I want to cover that song because it's really fun. And like we have, I have a couple of songs, like a Mac Allen Smith song, like called I'm Not Drunk and this Hank Williams one where I'm like, I just, I love singing them. So I'm just going to do that. And, um, yeah, I know ne it never occurred to me to change the genders. And then somebody was like, you know, you just made this song hella gay. And I was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, what welcome. am I here for if not transforming American culture one song at a time? Thank you. You're welcome. Exactly. I I, I need the, the PR people listening to this show need to make sure that uh, <laughs> Hank Jr. knows that. And, and here's that version of it, because that's I just would love that. too funny. That's too funny. I, I mean, I really think he'd appreciate it. I don't think he'd be mad. <laughs> no. No, because wouldn't. I mean, I'm sure that he has sung that song around a campfire with some other truckers or two. You're not going to convince me <laughs> that he has not. And uh, I think he would appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Hank Williams Jr. today probably would. The Hank Williams Jr. I grew up with probably wouldn't because he was a different cat in the 80s. But uh, <laughs> I know. Wasn't he a dinosaur? Yeah, Is something that, like that. that. Is that Hank Jr.? No, his, his, no, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Well, you know, you think that, right? But then you think about David Allen Coe, who's got lots of interesting and occasionally, frequently, problematic stuff in his songs and in his past. But he does have one of the first pro-gay country songs that was sung by a, a straight artist. Um, oh, shoot, I'm going to forget the name of it. But it's on one of his, the you know, the the albums that are sold in the old, the back of the motorcycle ones. Yep. Um, oh, was it called Fuck Anita Bryant? I think it might have been. Anyway, um, it's it's yeah, it's actually a very pro gay song in a kind of weird way, but it is. And I was like, the when I heard it the first time, I was like, oh, look at this! What's what's happening here? This is a strange and wonderful world I've entered into, where David Allen Coe is like being all yay for my people. I'm, <laughs> I think I love it, no, and I actually really do. I was, but I was a little confused the first time, and yeah, some of the stuff is talking about interesting dynamics in prison, so that's kind of awkward. But you know, what? it's a good song. Are you referring to Fuck Anita Bryant? I am. Yeah, that is the song I'm thinking of. Wow. That's a great uh, song title. I don't think I've ever heard it. I'm going to have to listen to that. <laughs> it, you know one. what? It, it's a good song. It really I was going to say that I have and not an, heard that one. And Anita Bryant was not, you know, not good to my people in the 80s. So I was, you know, I was like, okay, what's going on here? I like this. And and the the Wikipedia entry for the Nothing Sacred album, by the way, says, uh, in the song bluntly titled Fuck Anita Bryant... Co calls out Brian as being hypocritical for her opposition to the lifestyles of gay people. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. So there you go. we've got, a, I got a new song to go listen to now. That's good. <laughs> I'm here I've to listened help. To a, I've listened to a lot of David Allen Co, but I don't recall that one. So that's going to be fun to explore that. So <laughs> thank you time. for that. You're welcome. So while we're on the topic, um, I, and I, I, I mentioned this before we went to the break, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to ask um, about the, LGBTQ experience as a singer mm -hmm. and songwriter in the country music business. Does it hold you back? And how does it, if it, if so? Well, it's hard to know, right? Because people aren't going to tell you if that's not why they're booking you. They're not going to be like, oh, you want to play here and you're a gay, get out of here. Like they're not, like no one's that obvious anymore. And if they are, you know, I'd actually rather just know and not like waste my time anymore, right? Like there's, there's something, uh, awful and refreshing about people who are just awful to your face right that's a little easier to work with long term um <clears throat> i think that right now in country music there is a lot of desire to make sure that marginalized voices are heard and that there's more diversity or at least lip service to diversity you know not not every organization is actually putting their money where their mouth is but a lot of folks are at least saying they want to which is a it's a first step for sure um, I, to my knowledge, have not been, uh, kicked off or not booked for a show because of my sexual orientation. I, um, you know, also though, don't do the, the kind of like, I don't know how to describe it. Like the, uh, 
the whole glad handing networking with the flirtatious energy that people of both genders do to try to help get shows and stuff. I am a ridiculously friendly person, but I don't uh, tend to have that kind of particular energy about it. And I, so I do actually wonder if that has harmed me because I'm not giving people that like special shiny, like you're unique and I'm really excited about you. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't do that. Like, I'm just like, Oh my God, you're so cool. This is great. But like, I'm like a excited golden retriever as opposed <laughs> to like a, like a slinky, you know, like, hello, how are you? Like, I just, I don't know how, like, I, mean, I probably know how, but I just, it's not natural. So it's going to come off as really a uh, fake and that's just not who I am. So, um, you know, that being said, there are a number of queer people who have really actually broken through in country music and, um, you know, done really well. Brandy Carlisle, uh, Mary Gautier, whose name I always mispronounce and it makes me so angry because every, uh, anyway, I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, Orville Peck, obviously, you know, is doing, who is wonderful. Um, Brandy Carlisle, at the, there's so many people, Indigo Girls, like if you want my honest opinion, like they're country music. I know people put them in the folk camp. I think the difference between country music and folk music is like what a DJ wants to put on the radio and how they yeah. define it like 90% <laughs> yeah. of the time. Uh, Cause if you take an Indigo Girls song and you put it like in 1958 and we're like, what do you think this is? People would be like, well, that's country. Are you, are you slow? Like that's obviously country, you know? So um, I feel like there are a lot of people have made great strides. Lil Nas X also like helped really burst open like some concepts of like what, um, we can identify country music as like his song was country before Billy Ray Cyrus hopped on it. Right. But yeah. he really needed that. Uh, he needed that support from someone in the mainstream country industry to really uh, give him the validation for Billboard to put a country song back on the country charts, you know, and not be weird about it. Um, you know, that said, I do feel sometimes like there people are like, OK, well, we've got a few. So. We'll see you later. Like we got, we got like three or four. So, we could, you know, bye, you know, we're good. And I feel like they do that with uh, ethnicity. I feel like they do it with sexual identity. I feel like they do it, you know, with <laughs> pick your marginalized group. Like once yeah. they have like one or two folks, they're like, yeah, so see, we're not jerks. We're, we're solid. We're good. And, um, you know, if I hadn't personally actually listened to so much music by such a wide variety of people and known that like, there is amazing music that's just not being heard as much because there's just not as much room for it in the industry. Um, you know, some people just be like, well, if there was good music, it would get through. And I'm like, oh, that's just not always true. Mm -hmm. And it's not always true for, you know, straight white dudes either. Right. Like right. it's not true for all of us. It's really a matter a combination of luck and influence about who can get onto airwaves, onto festivals, into places. And, um, you know, I just think that you know the the main barometer should be talent and like you know and kind of being a nice person like i don't really want to see like people who are awful win because that's mm -hmm. not fun but you know whatever they can do i, I don't really <laughs> wish anyone negative things but i'm like it'd be great if nice people got you know <laughs> some extra sure. extra kudos you know well, well I, not not that I want to call you out for anything because obviously you know you're 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 riffing on a thing here, but I got to give a shout out to Katie Lang. So if we're going to talk, oh about, my god, oh, yeah. Yeah. yes, no, if thank we're going to talk about because... gay country music singers, I mean she was she was iconic in the eighties, and absolutely and, for sure, yeah, she was great. And thank you because I missed that, and that was a huge problem. <laughs> like that's really embarrassing that I you know missed her on my list of people but no, yeah no. katie lang is wonderful i yeah, think she, she's great she's great what a voice so right? you you have been called uh i don't remember who called you this but you have been called the queen of queer country uh which is a hell of a title uh, a hell of a, a banner to wear is there a point where you can be just a country singer and not a queer country singer or do you even want that <clears throat> Well, it's funny. So the Huffington Post was the first one and they called me the first lady of queer country. And then uh, whenever I'm in Canada, they call me the queen of queer country, which I think is really funny because I'm all like, because I'm Canada. American, I'm a first lady or president. Sure. But whatever. And, and they're always like, no, you're royalty. And I'm like, it's funny. <laughs> anyway, um, so that that divide cracks me up every time. Um, I don't have a problem with forever being known as a queer country artist. Um and, you know, this was interesting because this was a conversation that was kind of happening in the community for a while. Like, why do you want to identify like as queer? Are you trying to exploit 
the queerness thing to like get an extra foot in the door, like, you know, like leverage your identity politics to, you know, get notice where maybe you shouldn't otherwise have it. And that wasn't directed at me. It was like a larger conversation. And my take on it is that there are people all over the country and the world who are queer or marginalized in some way. And they have been told by marketing campaigns and, you know, capitalism, whatever, that this music is not for them, right? That they're not the demographic that this music is for. This is, they're not the demographic that this music is about. And even when they are small town farm kids that spend a whole bunch of time bailing hay and like feeding pigs, <clears throat> I did that at my friend's farm, like that it's not for you. You're, you're not one of these people. You need to go to the city. You need to leave, you know, your rural area. None of this is for you. And like, just go listen to some kind of other music because this is not your people and this is, you're not allowed. And if me being known as a queer singer makes them know that there are places where they are safe, like shows that they can come to where they're not going to get bashed, where their exact expression of themselves is not only welcomed, but it's honored. And ex I'm excited about seeing them there. Like whoever that is that I'm making it more open for, I want to keep doing that. You know, it doesn't. And if it hurts me or my reputation to be known as a queer country singer, well, those aren't the people I want to hang out with. Right. You know, and sure. <laughs> I would love to be like winning Grammys and Oscars for the soundtrack of some fabulous movie and like, oh, well, do you, and by the way, she's queer, but mainly she's super famous and awesome. Sure. Like that would be great. But also uh, the main thing for me is just being true to myself and making the right kind of art. And this is just who I am. And it's not a political statement. It's just what it is, you know, and, yeah. it, and in by being myself, if that's political, well, then there you go. I'm not afraid of that part. <laughs> Have you, do you know of, or maybe you know personally, um, Joby Riccio? No. Okay. I think you would appreciate her music. Um, my teen actually introduced me to her music. Um, it came up on her Spotify. And so she sent it to me and she's like, I think you'd, I like this, you know, this uh, singer. I think you'd really like her too. Yeah. And so yesterday I listened to the whole album and then finally um, I look in the notes and it, um, said something about her being queer and in country mm -hmm. and um i'm like okay where like uh, is it just me or am i finding out about all this like queer country stuff like um it's a, is it a coincidence or is uh -huh. it becoming like a bigger thing that we all ne really need to recognize and talk about um but i she's a young lady she's from originally from um colorado mm -hmm. and um i just loved everything that I heard from her and um, she's actually playing in Chicago tomorrow night. Found that out oh, on wow. Spotify too. That's cool. Um, and she's playing with lonesome Andrew. Do you know him? <gasps> I do. He's a good friend of mine. Oh, he just released, he just released uh, a couple of new songs. Yes. Just yes. yesterday. Yeah. So I saw, I've seen him and talk about David Lynch, Twin Peaksy. Mm -hmm. like yeah. He, like he would totally be a character in Twin Peaks. Yeah. Um, but he's he, wonderful. Jason, you got to check him out. He, okay. his, his live shows are, he's just so dramatic and his stage presence is fantastic. And, um, also queer. And, um, he's playing with Joby Riccio tomorrow night here in Chicago. And I really want to go. I don't have anyone to go with though. Um, oh, that's a, that's a shit excuse. I just know go. it is. I know. Stop yelling at me. <laughs> um, I know, I know. I, and I probably, will end up going and it's at a distillery jason oh, um like so oh both now of you, you gotta go we all love the brown liquor so um, we really do actually i've been there a couple times i've seen a couple shows there it's called judson and moore it's a newer distillery here in mm -hmm. chicago um i saw the cactus blossoms there um nice. i saw my guy nathan graham um but yeah so this show is happening tomorrow night and now i feel like i really i need to go absolutely <laughs> So and, and but, there are there are more queer country people kind of coming out and coming up in the scene. I actually there's a I just made a huge playlist because for Americana Fest, which starts next week, yeah. um, I've got I'm, I've got an official special event there, and they've got like a couple of them, actually oh. three I think total that are all highlighting uh, queer country artists. But then also um, they've booked like maybe a dozen or maybe a little bit less of queer country folks to have official showcases there this year. So. I feel like the the tide is rising. So, 
you know, and, and as it should, you know, and yeah. Oh, Joby Riccio that I was talking about, she won the um the John Prine songwriting. <gasps> oh, nice. Uh, is it a scholarship or fellowship? I'm I'm saying it all wrong, I'm sure, and I'm I really apologize, but um. So I know that is very um, prestigious, right, for a mm -hmm. songwriter. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing, you're going out on tour yes. and Americana Fest. Tell us about that. Um, well, Americana Fest starts next week on September 19th. And I've got a show that night where I'm playing with uh, Mia Byrne and um, Julian Talamantes Berlaski and a few other people. And then on Saturday, the 23rd, playing uh, another show uh, called the Queer Cowpoke Roundup at the Groove Records and like folks like Mia Burn, no, Mia's not there for that one, uh, Austin Lucas and Sean Obarago oh. and uh, Mercy Bell, Melody Walker, Julie Nolan. Um, I'm forgetting people and that makes me crazy. But yeah, uh, Wiley Gaby is going to be there too. Uh, he plays with Lonesome Andrew a fair bit. Um, we're going to have a, a great little show and that's going to be wonderful. And I get home for four days and then I hit the road on September 28th and we're going like Eugene and Portland and Bellingham and Yakima. Oh my God. And Yakima, we're playing a show called Beard Fest, which is like a facial hair competition, but it's also like a full day I've of already music won. competition. I feel like you should be there because then you will have won. It'll be beard. great. Hell yeah. Um, I've so been yeah, that's... <laughs> I haven't before. So my first time in Yakima. Uh, and then we'll get, place. I bet with a beard fest. I mean, how can it not be? <laughs> um, yeah. And then we'll be coming beard. back down to California and finishing up the tour in like Santa Cruz and San Francisco. So uh, it's all pretty exciting. And then right after that, boom, we go into the pre-production on the next record. So awesome. Yeah. Well, we were talking about uh, brown uh, uh, brown liquor a lot in this show, so we're gonna we're gonna head to break here Time with for a uh, drink. <laughs> with uh, another one from Mark's yard. This is rye whiskey. So. Oh, Welcome back to uh, Roots Music Rambler. Uh, awfully fun to talk to Cindy Imch. Make sure uh, you come by the uh, the old show notes and get those links. Go download those songs and all that good stuff. See where she's playing live so you can come see her. So great to have her on the show. Absolutely. Fun interview. Fun interview. All right. We, we've reached the picking, uh, picking and grinning part or the picking our grinnings part. I may, I may have misnamed that or screwed that up. But anyway, this is the point of the show where we, uh, we, we talk, we tell you uh, who uh, is making us grin with music and performances and whatnot. So we're sharing our picks that you should go listen to maybe new artists, maybe old artists, whatever. Uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to start off by asking Frank, I want to ask you this question before we get into who you're listening to now. I want right. to know, I'm curious, what's the first song you heard that like took your breath away ever yes um okay i do have a story for this um All right. so it was like 1997 98 perhaps and you know i was in my early 20s i was single and i'm driving in my little car in in chicago i've got the radio on and um local station wxrt 93.1 um and it's legendary so that's pretty much not the only station i listen to but the one i listen to the most but anyway so i'm listening to xrt and i'm driving um beautiful day out got the windows down and the song comes on the radio and i'd never heard it before i had no idea you know what um what what was going to happen and as it's playing I'm listening and I can feel myself like getting emotional and like my eyes start tearing and I'm like, what 
in God's name is happening here? So I actually pulled over um, to the curb, got out of the way of traffic. And um, I sat there for a little bit and I'm like, and it was one of those times when the song ended and the, the DJ didn't say the name or who oh. the artist is, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, uh, now, okay, this is the nineties. So I don't have a smartphone or anything. So, um, I called <laughs> the first chance I got, I called the radio station and said, okay, hear me out, you know? And, um, I explained what time it was, what song played <laughs> after it, you know? And, um, I don't know if it was the DJ that I spoke to or just a producer or someone. And he's like, Oh, he's like, that's California stars by Wilco and Billy Bragg. Ah, and now I okay. considered myself a pretty decent Wilco fan at this point. Right. And I'm first of all, now I'm mad that I had no idea that Wilco was involved in this. <laughs> um, second of all, I'm like, wait, what Wilco? So, um, yeah. And it turns out it was from Mermaid Avenue, the album that Wilco recorded with Billy Bragg. Um, their songs that are originally Woody Guthrie poems, um so wilco and billy bragg wrote music for the the these lyrics these poems and recorded them and put out this album mermaid avenue and it um is probably one of my favorite albums of all time and that song california stars still gets me to this mm -hmm. point um but yeah that's probably the the one where I had such a reaction to that song, the same sort of same thing happened to me the first time I ever heard Jason Isbell's cover me up. Uh. I was in the car again, driving um, this time though, I'm on the Dan Ryan expressway. And if you know anything about Chicago expressways and traffic, probably not a good place to have an emotional <laughs> breakdown. And um, yeah, so I kind of had the same reaction um, and I've, been in love with Jason Isbell's music since then. Yeah. I've actually been uh, uh, binging on Jason Isbell lately uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, primarily that I have not paid him enough attention uh, in the past. I've heard a few songs here or there, but I've never like really gotten into him. Um, yeah. And um, my relationship with Karen kind of opened that up because she loves drive by truckers. She loves Jason Isbell, you know, so I've been trying to, polish up. And I actually um, was uh, listening to some music the other day and there was a line in the song. I don't remember what song it was off the top of my head, but the line was, there's no such thing as somebody else's war. And that line kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, Oh my God, that's really good. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's an Isabel song. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's an Isabel song. And and it, it might be relatively recent, too. I don't know that it was an old song. Um, is it, it um, a... White Man's World? That's, yes. That is it. White Man's World. White, Which, yeah. by the way, that line stopped me in my tracks. The song. Amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. That's uh, off the Nashville Sound, which came out in 2017, I believe. Yeah. OK. Well, that's. That one got me. So I've been yeah. binging on Jason Isbell and Drive By Truckers a little bit, but Jason Isbell a lot lately. And um, I'm sorry that I did not get to, as far into him as I needed to years ago because I've missed a lot, but I'm catching up, which is good. That, that's um, fine. That's fine. He's one of those that you, you really do want to take your time and pay attention. He's got a lot to say. Mm -hmm. um, and he says it in a way that it's hard to disagree but he also says it in a way that um, even if you do disagree, disagree, you might consider his point of view. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he's he's a genius um, when it comes to writing lyrics. Well, there's also an interview series with him that's been cut up on TikTok. I've been catching bits and pieces of it with a writer from GQ whose name escapes me. Okay. Um, but he's, he was doing an interview for GQ and they just recorded it. The two of them having this conversation and it's cut up on little slices on TikTok. It's really good. Oh, um, okay. I'll, I'll try to find a link to wherever this is posted and, and put that in the show notes so that people can find it if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but it, it goes into a lot of his thinking behind some of his songs. And mm -hmm. um, I remember one of the questions was, what's your favorite 
you know, Jason Isabel saw him, they asked him that. And he said that at the time he said Elephant was probably uh -huh. his, you know, he thought it was the, the best song that he'd ever written, um, which I thought was really interesting. So I immediately went and listened to it like 12 times. Oh, um, my goodness. That's one. And I mean, when that one comes up on the shuffle, I'm usually not in the right mental state to listen to it. <laughs> so I skip it. Yeah. But my goodness, what a powerful song. Yeah. So another artist that I wanted to share with everybody, um, I'm actually, um, there's a, a, a strange event. Well, I shouldn't say strange. It's not, that's relative. Um, there's an event next week at the, the week that this will come out. I will have already, when you're seeing and hearing this, I will have already been to this event. Um, it's next Tuesday after, when we're recording this. Um, but it's uh, John Haywood is the name of the artist. And he is a world renowned banjo player. Uh, which I thought you would you would like. Um, he's also a his his day job is a tattoo artist, um, okay. which those two things don't seem to go together in my brain for some reason. <laughs> um, but he also moonlights uh, as the lead singer of a heavy metal band. So now I'm really fucking confused. Um, <laughs> but he is playing at an art gallery closing, like it's the last night of this big three week run of of artists. And uh, there's several people who are going to be playing music, and he's kind of the headliner. And it happens to be at a gallery here in Louisville. And he's also from Whitesburg, Kentucky, or that's where his – he's from Floyd County, Prestonsburg, Kentucky, which is about 25 minutes from my house uh, okay. where, I grew, where I grew up. Whitesburg is probably 30 minutes the other way. Okay. Um, but Whitesburg is where Apple Shop is, which a lot of great artists and filmmakers and musicians go through the Apple Shop. Uh, program in, in Whitesburg, but he lives in Whitesburg. He's a tattoo artist and a banjo player and in a heavy metal band. And I'm completely fascinated by this dude. So that is uh, awesome. I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm going to try to, I may grab a quick interview with him if he's available and I can yeah. get 10 minutes of his time, but I may just say, Hey, can I just get your number and let's get you on the show and bring him on and talk to him in a future episode. If he'll do that, I would be, honored and flattered and it would be a lot of fun because i know you you like the banjo so it'd be fun for y'all to I talk do. banjo so. i do have a soft spot for the banjo remind me you now you play correct like you can play the banjo i could play um like <laughs> almost everything else in my life um covid killed my banjo <laughs> playing um yeah uh, I, during that whole pandemic, I was just not feeling creative at all. And that was, you know, like sort of in, not in the middle, but it was also at the time when I was doing a lot of travel writing, traveling, freelance writing. Um, and I had a real hard time just getting anything written. I picking up my banjo, forget about it. It didn't happen. I mean, it was like, took three whole years for me to even take it out of the case. So, um, yeah, I did play for a time and I would love to play again. It's just a matter of finding the time to really get into it again. You know, gotcha. Remind everybody your next couple of events or the next events you're going to. So, um, this weekend. So again, after, or when you're, when you hear this, I will yes. have already, uh, seen drive by truckers. Um, Again, uh, well, again, yeah, I don't even know how many times I've seen drive by truckers now. Okay. Um, so we're going to see them this Saturday night at, in Bloomington, Illinois. Um, and they are playing with American Aquarium, mm. which I'm very excited to see. I've not seen them as a full band before. Um, so I'm really excited. And we opted to go down to Bloomington for this show rather than trying to get tickets to the show the next night in Chicago um, at the, this new venue It's called the salt shed. And okay. it's a really cool place. Um, we saw Jason Isbell there last year, um, but it's drive by truckers, American aquarium and the Jayhawks. So that's a big freaking deal. Yep. Um, so we didn't even like try to get tickets for that. Um, just because it was probably going to be a really popular, you know, a hot ticket. Um, and also it's a school night, you know, it's a Sunday. <laughs> so um, we're going to go down to Bloomington instead. 
There and it'll go. be nice, you know, nice little getaway. Um, so see and drive by truckers. Um, and then, oh, uh, I don't have another show until towards the end of October. Um, Nathan Graham's record release party. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're hoping to get Nathan on the show as well. So, yeah, and, he told and, you me know, if we could get a drive by trucker on, that'd be great, too. But you oh. know, one thing, one step at a time. Yeah, baby steps. <laughs> all right well i told you guys i'm doing the 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 john uh, haywood event uh next week or the week by the time you see this i will have already been there so we'll have some good stuff to report back on uh next time around i guess that's going to wrap up this edition roots music rambler is a production of falls and partners copyright 2023 our theme music is sheepskin and beeswax by Gentacorum. follow us online at rootsmusicrambler.com look for of uh, us blah, blah, blah. look for all of us stuffs on the social media that's what I was trying to say. Go look for us there on the TikTokers and the and the Instagrammers and the and the stuffs. We're there. Just look for Roots Music Rambler. You'll find us. And make sure you mash that subscribe or follow button so you remember to join us for the next Ho Down a Throwdown. Cheese Frank. He's false. And whatever you do, kids, ramble on. All right. Sorry, Jason. That's okay. Jason's not used to being so quiet. Yeah, I'm. I'm usually <laughs> talking over top of everybody. I'm. I'm the. I'm kind of the bull in the china shop most of the time. But this is great. I have yeah. one more Michigan. I have one more MSU question for Cindy. Okay. Um, what years were you there? Uh, ninety-two to ninety-six. Oh. Okay, I was there from ninety-one to ninety-five. Look at that. Oh my God! I lived in Mason Abbott Hall most of that time. Mason Abbott. Okay. First year I was in Phillips. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, which is right across from Abbott, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I moved to because then I discovered beer and boys. <laughs> so I moved to South Campus because that's where the parties were. Yeah. And um, so I lived in Holden. Okay. And then um junior year I moved off campus into Cedar Village, like almost everybody did. Um, and then senior year I moved back into the dorm for the first semester because the second semester I went. I did study abroad, so okay. I didn't want to mess with subleasing an apartment yeah, or yeah. anything like that. Yeah, I voted for Bill Clinton in the basement of your dorm. Me too. That was my first presidential election, and I was like, <gasps> "Do you remember only... when they were on campus for the debates?" I shook his hand. Oh yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I was there too. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> you want me to? Just, I, I can go out for dinner and come back and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> There you I, went go. To, I, I went to MSU for college too, but mine was Moorhead State. The school's so nice they named it after a sex act. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this will be good. Post show blooper real thing. Just me dancing. Sup, y'all? <laughs>